Well, hi. So we've hit the half century point. It was a good time to look back. It's been a turbulent, terrifying time. But now we're in a predominantly hopeful period. How did we get here? Well, we usually think of the first decades of this century as the slide to chaos, the dark decades. But today I'm offering a fresh perspective. In fact, most of the ideas that formed the foundation of our mid-century great transformation were first seeded in those dark decades. So this presentation pays homage to those few lonely souls that were pioneering the ideas that have now become mainstream thinking. Back then, they were mostly disregarded as impractical idealists, but time has shown they were in fact the only ones thinking practically. In fact, in honor of those times, I'm giving this presentation today in the style they used back in those days. That's, that's why I'm looking so funny wearing these clothes. And I'm going to present to you using an old-fashioned combination of two-dimensional video and something they used to call PowerPoint slides. So bear with me. So, the dark decades. Even then, in the first couple of decades of this century, people knew the climate was spiraling out of control. This is an image that went viral around that time, showing exactly that. And you can see it in three dimensions, just showing how the temperature of the globe was uh, increasing at a faster rate, month by month even, getting out of control. And yet, the world leaders at the time, in a big global conference at the end of 2015 in Paris, declared victory. They celebrated pledges that they knew, even then at the time, were going to lead the world to disaster. Basically, you see that red line. That was the set of commitments they made at that time, which, if there were no continued progress from them, would lead the world to three and a half degrees Celsius warming by the end of this century. And of course, there were other elements to those dark decades. There was the extreme global wealth inequality. This map shows what the world looked like at the time if you measured the size of each country according to their wealth rather than the actual territory that the, uh, that the country covered. Just unbelievable. Maybe even more amazing um, was this uh, fact that the richest 80 people at that time had the same wealth as the poorest 50% of the entire world's population. Meanwhile, a billion people went hungry every day, and another billion were chronically malnourished. Political extremism was getting more rabid by the year, threatening a return to the brutality of the previous century. And meanwhile, global corporations were taking over world governance through a tangle of trade agreements that allowed them to sue sovereign nations if that nation passed legislation that interfered with the profits of the corporations. So in responding to these dark decades, there were a whole series of what we now see as insufficient actions. There were cap and trade agreements that allowed false accounting for greenhouse gas emissions, essentially subsidizing turning rainforests into monocropping. Many countries in the West, such as the US, finally passed bipartisan carbon taxes, but they were too weak for meaningful impact. And meanwhile, renewable energy was increasing and gradually replacing fossil fuels. This is a chart showing energy sources from 1970 all the way to today, but at not nearly the pace that was needed. Here you can see what really was needed was an 80% reduction in fossil fuels from that time period to this. 
Meanwhile, at the time, some argued for what they called a good Anthropocene, uh, essentially embracing um, some notion of uh, human domination of the world. And others advocated policies based on ecosystem services, taking this kind of metaphor of global capitalism, applying it to the natural world. These were well-meaning folks that thought this was the only way that they could speak the language of the dominant uh, way of thinking. But all these people ignored Einstein's great insight that problems cannot be solved with the same mindset that created them. So what was that old mindset? Well, it started with the notion that humans are intrinsically selfish and greedy. And selfish behavior by individuals is actually in the best interest of everyone. As a result of which, the government's responsibility is really just to keep markets free for unfettered capitalism. And the, re the measure of success in what they did was called the gross domestic product. Even though it simply measured the rate at which nature was being monetized and brought into the global capitalist economy. So not surprisingly, um, on this basis, the world moved towards the brink in the 2030s. Parts of Iran, Pakistan, and the Middle East became too hot for human habitation. A quarter of the Amazon rainforest was lost in a multi-year mega forest fire. And of course, we all remember the hurricane-induced tidal wave that totally submerged Miami. And meanwhile, much of Bangladesh was being lost to flood water. As a result of all this, we saw hundreds of millions of refugees there and everywhere around the world migrating for survival. Prices of staples, of course, skyrocketed, leading to food riots across the world. And nuclear wars threatened in three regions at the same time. And of course, we all remember that iconic Time magazine issue with that uh, front page headline asking, is this the end of civilization? But even as things got more desperate by the year, and it seemed the very end of civilization itself was looming, a new force was emerging that had gradually been picking up energy while the focus of the media was on how things were unraveling. This was the force of interconnected people power. How did it enable? such profound transformation that surprised even the people themselves who were affecting it. Well, to understand this to begin with, we need to look at some of the shifting demographics of values at the time. So, looking just for a moment at the US, at that time, say back in 2008, um, we could have seen, we could see three distinct subcultures, which have been called traditionals, moderns, and cultural creatives. The traditionals, about a quarter of the population at that time, were socially conservative, had strong religious beliefs, and held nostalgia for the past. The moderns, representing the biggest share at that time, were consumer-oriented. They valued personal and financial success, and they lived an urban, uh, high-tech lifestyle for the most part. And then roughly a third of the country was comprised of what were called cultural creatives, people who valued ecological sustainability, who were receptive to other cultures, and were concerned with the quality of life rather than just um, financial success. Now, at that time, in the early decades of, of the 21st century, that number of cultural creatives had been increasing from about a quarter of the population just 13 years earlier. And that number continued to increase for the next 
24 years. So that when we look at 2032, we see that the percent of cultural creatives was now um, more than 50%, the majority of the country. And these people were connecting with each other and th with other um, people like them throughout the world in the incredibly enhanced internet connectivity, sharing their emerging values, ideas, and mobilizations. All of this as a result of what's known as Metcalfe's Law, which is that the usefulness of a network grows exponentially when its connections grow arithmetically. So if you have two nodes, there's one connection. Five nodes, you have 10 connections. If you go up to 12 nodes, all of a sudden you have 66 connections. And with the power of the internet at that time, the uh, amount of connections in the three, in demographically across the world led to a self-organized intelligence of humanity, a lot like the self-organized intelligence that emerges in nature that you see in things like flocks of starlings or termite colonies. So similarly, we saw a new self-organized human intelligence forming, a collective intelligence where humanity began to see itself as an interconnected whole. So as nation states began to lose credibility, a worldwide people's movement was demanding action. Peaceful civil disobedience became the norm around the globe. Hundreds of millions of citizens in countries everywhere refused to accept business as normal. And this was what led to what we now know as the Great Transformation. To understand it, it helps to um, step back a little bit and look at some of the great transitions that have happened in human history. So about 10,000 years ago, um, the world moved from being predominantly hunter-gatherers to the rise of agriculture, with a whole new set of values that drove people's activity. Another great transition happened about 400 years ago with the scientific revolution, which again spawned a new set of values, a new way of people seeing their relationship with each other and with the natural world. And now in our present era, we're undergoing another of these great transitions that we call the Great Transformation. And that Great Transformation is based on a new foundation of values based on our intrinsic connectedness within ourselves, with others, with the natural world, and with the entire earth. And this is what that new foundation of values is based on. A sense of the importance of the quality of life rather than simply material possessions. A belief that political, social, and economic choices should be based on our shared humanity. And a sense that civilization's future has to be built on the basis of environmental sustainability. So from this core set of foundations arose a coherent platform of alternative ideas that were being um, compelled to be taken and used as a result of this worldwide people's power. So here's what these ideas um, were mostly composed of. A muscular United Nations with enforcement powers over the global commons, such as oceans, the atmosphere, the environments, and fresh water. An atmospheric trust for residual carbon usage. This trust allowed um, the right to mine the residual carbon to be auctioned off to the highest bidders and those proceeds would belong to all of humanity and invested in green energy adoption, climate adaptation and refugee resettlement. Another demand was the reduction in global income inequality. 
with the global wealth tax, which now is applied to the top 1% of wealthy individuals around the world and administered by the United Nations. And along with that, a universal basic income, which has been bringing billions out of poverty and has the effect of decommoditizing labor and providing a true choice of employment for everywhere, for everyone around the world. Corporations now um, are seen as existing for humanity rather than simply to optimize shareholder returns. And they are now a, a triple bottom line is required for corporate charters. Triple bottom line of people, profit, and the planet. And of course, no corporate personhood is allowed anymore in the United States. And advertising is now limited to communicating information without images, video, or music, and thereby not appealing to people's implicit emotions. Meanwhile, worker-owned co-ops have become a major force in global commerce, now employing about 500 million people worldwide. That's about a five-fold increase over the dark decades. And they promote great transformation values, such as equity and fairness, solidarity, social responsibility, democracy, and transparency. We've invested a lot now in the circular economy that increases employment while reducing waste with products designed for repair and recycling, sourcing from recycled materials, and waste virtually eliminated with biological nutrients re-entering the biosphere safely and technological nutrients being recycled and reused. The learning from those early transition towns of the dark decades are now being applied to eco-city design everywhere. We've gotten used now to community gardens on every block, extensive use of rooftops and aquaponics. And cars are banned from most city centers, um, with only pedestrians, bicycles, and public transportation being allowed. With the result that most megacities now are 80% self-sufficient in food. Meanwhile, agroecology has been replacing global industrial monocropping around the world. Based, it's based on permaculture principles of appropriate design and integration with the landscape. And it gives greater crop biodiversity, allows for sequestering carbon. It creates greater water efficiency, leads to virtual elimination of synthetic fertilizer, and, and of course, a big reduction in global food transportation. Meanwhile, the gross domestic product has been replaced by the general progress indicator to measure national activity. This factors in negatives, such as income inequality and environmental pollution and crime and factors in positives such as volunteer work, household work, and education, all of which were ignored by GDP. And this general progress indicator was in a consistent decline from 1978 until just um, 2042. And now we're on track for the first decade of increase in this indicator since all that time in the last century. And then, of course, the United Nations Rights of Nature puts the natural world on the same legal standing as humanity. Personhood has now been given to ecosystems such as watersheds, rivers, and forests, and high-functioning mammals such as chimpanzees, elephants, and whales. And ecocide has been defined as an international crime that can be prosecuted by the International Criminal Court. Now these concepts that we now take for granted were already being fleshed out by those pioneers of the dark decades. So let's take a look at that, and get a better sense of that. <clears throat> Back in those early decades of this century, there was already a networked movement for change taking place, connecting up 
a movement such as indigenous rights and climate activism, which also connected with early, uh, the early movement for the rights of nature, which in turn connected with agroecology. And all of that connected up with the fight for economic equity, which itself was interconnected with the fight for racial equity. And all of that uh, connected up with the tr move towards urban transformation. Finally, everything there connected with this new sense of focusing on the quality of life. So all these different movements together created this powerful network, movement for change. And in fact, um, the movements themselves, the boundaries between them began to get blurred. It was the connections that began to be even more important, allowing ultimately for the emergence of the great transformation. And in fact, all of our current norms that we've just been going through were being pioneered during those dark decades. In fact, people already held great transformation values. Uh, if you look at a worldwide survey in those early decades <coughs> of this century on attitudes to the natural world, we actually find that uh, three quarters of the people even then believed we should coexist with nature rather than, quote, master nature. <coughs> and about three quarters of people in Europe and North America believed that environmental protection is more important than economic growth, even if some jobs were lost. And there were already about a million grassroots organizations worldwide. And one of the visionaries of that time, his name was Paul Hawkins, actually saw that and called it the largest social movement in all of human history. So why didn't we see it coming back um, when the world was on the brink? Well, one reason for this is to understand the non-linearity of change. And one way we can get a sense of that is to go a little bit further back in history and see how other changes took place that nobody expected until finally they just became the, the norm around the world. So we can look, for example, at universal human rights. Back in 1791, Thomas Paine wrote The Rights of Man. He was tried and convicted for seditious libel for in his home country of England. It took a long time, but 1948, the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted, which set out fundamental human rights to be universally protected. We can take a look at women's suffrage. Back in 1897, the National Union for Women's Suffrage was founded in England. Ten years later, 3,000 people marched in London for women's rights to vote in what was called the Mud March. Well, only a couple of decades later, women gained the right to vote in the UK and in the US, and then some decades after that, basically, virtually the rest of the world followed suit. How about environmental awareness? <clears throat> well, in 1962, Rachel Carson published Silent Spring. It was the first public expose of the indiscriminate use of pesticides. Well, her solitary stance at that time was denounced as hysterical and unscientific. Well, just eight years later, there were 20 million Americans marching to protect the environment in the first Earth Day in 1970. And two decades after that, by 1990, 200 million people in 141 countries were demonstrating for the Earth. We see the same thing with same-sex marriage. In 1996, the Defense of Marriage Act, called DOMA, was passed by both houses of Congress in the U.S. with large veto-proof majorities. It was signed into law by President Bill Clinton and codified non-recognition of all same-sex marriages 
for all federal purposes. Less than two decades later, the Supreme Court had overturned the key provision of DOMA. The federal government recognized same-sex marriage with full benefits. A couple of years after that, DOMA was completely overturned and more than half of Americans approved same-sex marriage by this time. So public support, what we learn, follows a non-linear path of change. You have an early adoption phase, which is char characterized by what we can think of as ideological lock-in. People stick with received attitudes and opinions, even when they become out of date. There's social rigidity, political inertia. The common refrain is, it'll never happen. And then there's a tipping point. You see a crescendo of change where influential thought leaders start to attract increasing numbers. The stickiness of that old thinking gets superseded by the pull of new ideas. And the herd instinct that is very characteristic of much of humanity shifts the direction towards that new thinking. All of a sudden, everybody wants to get on board. And that leads to a new stable state of widespread adoption where the news, new ways of thinking become institutionalized. There's always some diehard reactionaries, but now they're in the minority. And then the common refrain looks back and says, it was inevitable. Now, when we look at how the great transformation happened, one question is, how did it emerge so rapidly? in really just about roughly 15 years from that 2030 to 2045 time frame. Well, a couple of reasons we can see for this is one is the magnitude of the crisis. You had the worldwide climate emergency, this gaping global inequality, the threat of total environmental collapse and the breakdown of political order around the world. And then another reason is the rise in the power of the internet. The increased transmittal of the sp of speed of new ideas around the world and the emergent global sense of shared humanity. This was something that had never happened before in history. So when we look back on that, it kind of really gives credence to the words of the early anthropologist Margaret Mead who, is, who said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. So to end with, let's just look ahead for a few moments to what we can expect going forward. Well, we're still dealing with the consequences of the inadequate response to climate change from those early decades. If you look at that chart that they celebrated um, back in 2015, well, we see that where we are now is um, somewhat better than their, um, their commitments they made back in those decades, but nowhere close to what was needed in order to avoid the, uh, the climate effects that we're dealing with now. As a result, the climate emergency continues. We're still facing big pressures on our global system with the ongoing refugee crisis and the massive rebuilding that's required of urban infrastructures. And we are suffering continued food shortages worldwide. And we're also looking at an increasing threat of tipping points, such as the West Antarctic ice sheet the Greenland ice sheet melting, and the increased risk of methane from melting permafrost. But even while we're looking at these threats and trying to work out how we're going to deal with them, the great transformation offers us hope for a flourishing future. We're enjoying a managed annual reduction in GDP along with an, an annual increase in GPI. We're putting massive investment in new infrastructure for the global south. And we're beginning to implement that half-earth 
strategy that was first floated again during those dark decades um, to save remaining biodiversity by allocating half of the Earth's and territory to nature rather than to human civilization. And then Operation Drawdown, which again began during those dark decades, is helping us greatly now to find ways to reduce carbon systematically from the atmosphere. So as we pause for a moment, look at the future and to look at the past, I think it's appropriate to just spend a moment to give thanks to those pioneers of the dark decades. Because without their pioneering work, we wouldn't be in this place of hope for future flourishing that we're in now. Thank you.